the live chat about the business, you know, because things have changed a lot. And um, I see people, you know, on social media struggling with their careers and doing things that one would think would be a mistake. I've made many mistakes. Um, the problem is with mistakes, not the problem, but you learn from mistakes, hopefully, but they, they take away your time and we only have a limited amount of time. You know, what's crazy is that I read recently that the lifespan of a <clears throat> screenwriter in Hollywood is 10 years, it's 10 years, boom, boom. So you work hard <clears throat> for all this stuff to happen. And then if you're cooking and you're at the top of your game and, you know, doing things uh, 10 years, uh, of course, your results may vary. <laughs> um, I've done this longer than that, luckily. Um, but, you know, you always feel blessed every time out, you know. Um, so anyone uh, have any questions? I'll just uh, sort of start. My name is Mark Sanderson. I am a screenwriter. I have been doing this since I've been 11 years old. Um, hello. Glad to see you. Um, started making films when I was 11 years old with my best buddy, who's still my very close friend. Um, and he received a film camera, like you always hear about. And we just started making movies, you know, and that's when the creative spark happened. You know, I just knew that I wanted to make movies. However it would happen, I don't know. I don't care. So we made lots of short films, um, you know, science fiction, uh, thrillers, action, adventure, secret agent, things that influenced us at the time. We were 11 and 12 years old. Took ourselves very seriously. Uh, the films would range anywhere from 20 minutes to um, later on when we were in high school, we sort of separated and had two studios, so to speak, and our, our stable of actors. And the films would range up to 45 minutes, you know, as a short film. Entered them in contests. Uh, I remember going to San Francisco to this big contest once, um, receiving an award. You know, there was exciting times. And then going to film school, uh, where we thought we would, you know, sell our specs for millions of dollars because that was happening during that period. Um, and then it took six years out of film school to land my first professional writing job. So that wasn't for lack of trying, you know, it's just the way, the way it is. And, um, you know, if you want to stay in this for the long haul, you have to have a game plan. <clears throat> You have to ask yourself, which I've learned, why are you writing the script that you're writing? Is it just you had an idea and thought it'd be a fun movie, which is okay. Um, yes, you can't chase trends because the films today were made a year and a half to two years ago, already in development. So what's coming out today, if you backtrack it, you know, next year will be something different. But you can see what is making, <clears throat> what, what Hollywood is making. Are they doing Westerns? There's some low budget Westerns, sure. But are the big giant tentpole Westerns being made? Kevin Costner, okay. But that's just one person. So you have to ask about your specs. Why are you writing the spec that you're writing? You know, um, ask yourself these important questions because the thing you don't want to waste is time. Time is precious. Um, we don't get it back. It's our greatest commodity, I believe. And it takes time to craft a solid body of work that someone, let's say an agent can look at and say, oh, okay. Um, and you don't just get an agent from a script. You have to have something to back it up with. Um, that was kind of my problem when I sold my spec. I didn't have follow-ups. I, I wasn't thinking in the in those terms. And so it was about four, four ish, five years that I didn't, I didn't, you know, find my next job. But luckily it was with the company that bought my spec and made it. So I had a relationship with them, which started, uh, you know, a sort of a career of, of, of script assignment work, which is the bread and butter of working screenwriters. When you consider that <clears throat> there's about 11,500 members of the Writers Guild and maybe five-ish thousand reported income last year, almost 6,000 out of 11,500, the rest of those writers are either living on residuals, not if they've only written one movie, but they have a day job 
or they're trying to, you know, drive Uber, they're trying to do something, even though they're in the Writers Guild. I'm in the Writers Guild. Oh, I got my card, but I haven't worked in a year. It happens. You know, there's no guarantee once you're in the uh, guild that you're going to be, you know, knocking it out of the park for Warner Brothers every year. So you have to think about that. And um, sort of going back to representation, I find so many writers finish their script. They say, I got to find an agent. No, most writers are not ready for an agent or a manager or to be working professionally. You can't come to them with one piece of material and say, well, what else have you been doing? You have to show them that you're, it's like you almost don't need them, right? You've been so busy doing, I produced a film and I was in this uh, festival and I've got these things going on and they want to see that you're busy, that you're working, that you're just not walking up to their door and dropping a script and saying, Make my career, you know, which um, usually isn't the case. Agents, managers, they all have clients who most of them are probably not working or maybe many, many of them are or they have to find jobs for those clients. That's their job. And so they're going to take on another client because why? I've been a hip pocket client before and that's when an agent or manager says, okay, um, I... I'm not going to sign you, but you can use my name and uh, we'll see what happens. And, you know, if something happens, great. If it doesn't, you know, it's no problem for them. They don't really have to push, push, push. Um, example being a friend of mine has a manager. And I've always found that managers were the better uh, fit before an agent because a manager will find you an agent usually. A manager usually comes out of production or development and they, um, excuse me, manager usually comes out of development, wants to move into production, but they have a background in development, you know, story and things like that and connections. So manager, when it comes time to send you out, will find an agent. That's my, been my experience. They'll connect and then they'll launch the script. So my friend signed with a manager and uh, things were fine to begin with, you know, and then sort of radio silence. And it's not for, my friend was, was, hot during the signing, right? He had, he just came off a movie. And so he goes through the Rolodex. He goes through the um, the files of the manager. Uh, production value. Hey, great to see you. Um, he goes through the client list and says, oh, these would be good people for me to meet. Telling the manager this. Could you hook up a lunch? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Months go by nothing. That was what a manager would love to do, right? Hook up a producer with a writer or a producer with an editor, and he represents both of them. But this never happened. So he's thinking of firing the manager because you can do that if, if things aren't working out. Excuse me. Um, so it's not always fun and games. It's, it's mostly not fun and games. It's mostly, you know, a business. And I've had managers that were great. And, you know, when we went out with something uh, via an agent and, you know, things didn't turn out, they would say, it's okay. You know, the script's not dead. We'll find a home sometime. And then what are we going to work on next? Okay. And then they give you notes and blah, blah, blah. And they really love the thing and send it out. But you're spending your time with someone uh, and it's important. And it could end up being a waste of time for a few years, which has happened before. Uh, or ghosting goes on where you can't get a call back from your rep, you know. So there's all sorts of um, uh, scenarios that can happen about, you know, finding an agent or a manager. They, you know, I think writers think it's just, well, once I get someone, I have a career. No, it, that's just another hurdle to jump over. You know, they have to go send you out and trust the fact that you can deliver the goods, right? You can work on a TV series that you've never maybe been in a writer's room before. You can sell a screenplay and then, uh, or sell a, a pitch and then have to write the script in eight to 12 weeks. Can you do that? Did it take you three years to, to get your spec in order that it's just perfect, but it took three years. You won't have that luxury. Um, you, do you have specs to burn out? You know, when, when I had a writing partner, we had an agent at a, at a mid-level agency who loved to sell specs and we wrote specs, but he'd go out with one. And, you know, 40 companies 
And then you'd hear on Friday if it's like, you know, yes, we bought it or a bidding war. And then you don't hear. And then they say, well, on Monday, you have a lot of meetings, but that spec is dead. Nobody's going to buy it. They didn't buy it. You're like, okay, that took six months of our life. So then you take the meetings, you know, the dozen or so meetings. They go, oh, we love you. We loved your writing. This is so, and hopefully they say, well, we have something on the shelf that you guys would be perfect for. That also happened. And then you try to get that job or all those meetings are just generals to say, ah, oh, we like you. We like your writing. This is fantastic. And then you go back and the agent says, okay, what else you got? That's going to say, what else you got? And you go, well, uh, we have a few ideas. Okay, go write one. Then you go write one and that takes however many months, right, to get it in shape and this and you come back and then they have their notes, the agents or managers, and they go through it. Ah, I don't like this part. And this is and this is not selling. But and finally, you get to the point of launching it again. And then what if that doesn't sell? You know, and this happened. And then, you know, it goes out to 10 companies, not 40. And then they start to go, hmm, these writers aren't exactly, uh, you know, knocking it out of the park. And they do it a third time, right? And then it's sort of lukewarm, like, yeah, you know, and then you do tap dancing and spinning plates and da, 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 da. And they said, that's the idea. Write that idea. And then my partner will go off and write that idea, right? It takes three, four months, you know, because um, at that time, you know, we were still spec writers. We didn't have jobs in the business. We write that idea, give it to the agent. He says, eh. It's not for me. And that was basically three times, no sale, see you later. I can't spend any more time with these writers to launch a career. So you see how things can happen where it looks great. I got an agent. He's, he's in my, he or she is in my corner. You know, they're giving me notes and this and that. And then suddenly it's not for me, which is basically saying I'm done, you know? So then you Go back to your manager who goes, it's okay, we'll find someone else, but you've got three specs out there that have already been tainted because no one has purchased them. It's like no one's bought the house. So many people came by to look at the house and they, why? Well, you know, this it's the, the appearance that other people didn't buy it. So there must be something wrong with it. You know, it's tainted, you know, and I always like to believe that no spec is ever dead, but appearances are everything in the business. So, um, you know, so that basically um, is why beginning and early writers forget about the agent, the manager. You know, you know, the better thing, in my opinion, would be to build those vital relationships that you're going to need one-on-one uh, -on -one with producers, executives, directors, and assistants. Um, that's kind of overlooked because every assistant does not want to be an assistant forever. They want to get the experience, bring something in and move on. That's what happened with my first spec. An assistant to the president of this production company was able to get my script uh, through my friend's friend. My friend's friend wanted to produce it. She was an assistant, but she didn't have the pull. So she showed it to the other assistant and he was like, oh my gosh, I want to show this to my boss. They optioned the script 18 months. I did all the work while they were trying to find the financing and then it fell through many times. And then finally they purchased the script. And then a year later it was made, but that was a long journey. That one, that was seven years from the time I, I typed fade out to the time on the first day of photography. So not every spec or not every sale is an immediate, you know, like I say, every project has its own, you know, adventure and some and, and drop some languish, some never get made, you know, it happens. But that's why, as I say, this is a long haul journey to reach any level of success. Um, and you have to be ready, you know, to take, take the blows emotionally, you know, financially, you know, there's all these things that besides the writing, the writing, of course, you have to grow as a writer, but there's so many ups and downs. It's like a roller coaster that you can, you know, as, as I always say, you know, you almost can't expect any outcome, you know, have no expectations because you'll be surprised when you think it's not. And when you think it is, it won't be. So it's like up and down, up and down in a business where no one likes to read, you know, isn't that surprising that no one, everyone wants to say that I'll read your screenplay, but they never read the screenplay. I mean, that's the follow through is the problem. 
the good intentions are the word that someone wants credit. I want credit. Yeah, I, I told you I'd read your script. That costs nothing. Six months later, you call and say, did you read the script? And they say, no, I was so busy. I've been swamped. I mean, have you ever heard this before? Of course. It's the way things are done. Um, so, you know, as I went back to say, most writers are not ready for representation. They're not ready to work professionally. Yeah, they can muster up and write a good screenplay, sure. But the ability to do it again and again and again and again. So if you come with a package of stuff, I made a short film. I placed in this, I won this, I, I worked on this, you know, I've got three solid, um, you know, specs that no one has seen, you know, they're not tainted. Wow, this person, and then you have a clear, unique voice. This person is attract, you know, the an agent or manager or rep could be attracted to this. But again, I hear, um, I mentor several people and they say, oh, this manager, they're so excited that the manager was interested. Okay, that's, that's good. What have they done while you're doing stuff? What have they done? You know, you're doing this and they're doing this, that that's, you know, it's great to be loved and be loved, but <laughs> you know, if nothing's happening, <coughs> excuse me, we once had a manager, no, excuse me, an agent who was the head of the agency, God bless his soul, but he, his best days were decades prior to our you know, meeting with him. So he was sort of at the end of his career and he still had some connections, but we got maybe two meetings, but boy, he was like old school. He answered our calls and brought us to lunch and was involved in the projects. And we just loved him. But two years went by in a blink of an eye and you have to know when to say when, like, okay, I'd rather not have somebody who I think is doing something for me and living this illusion where they ghosted me at some point, or like my friend did, if I'm asking my manager, like, Hey, I've looked up your other clients. Could you set up a lunch meeting with me? Cause I'm a client. Oh yeah. That's, you know, you're doing, you're always, I don't care if you're signed with a big, you're always going to be doing the work. You just can't sit back and think they're on the phone every day, you know, Yes, I'm push. I, you're looking for a yeah, blah, blah, blah. They're on the phone every day. Blah, blah, blah. You know, no, you find somebody and then you say, call my agent, or you call your agent and say, hey, I met this producer. You know, you're you're looking at the leads. Yes, they can help, of course, but don't fall in the fantasy that once you get signed or once they say yes, you're a hip pocket client that you know you can go to sleep and just say, well, I don't have to write again or I don't have to do anything. No, you have to. So any questions up to this point as I continue to ramble? <laughs> Again, I'm a little under the weather, so I apologize. Again, for those who haven't, um, my book is on Amazon, A Screenwriter's Journey to Success, Tips, Tricks, and Tactics to Survive as a Working Screenwriter in Hollywood. Um, I just... I just did a 2024 update version. It's not a complete new book. Um, little things in it I updated. Um, buy the paperback because books books are important to have. I think, you know, as you can see, books, books. Question about editing. Yes, Nicolette has a question about editing. Please go ahead. Oh, there we go. Any advice on a how to kill your darlings and which ones to kill without actually killing, ruining the whole vision and goal of the story? <clears throat> yeah, kill your darlings. People um, give that quote, I guess, to Kubrick maybe. I don't know. These quotes float around. What she means, for those who don't know, is kill your darlings, meaning when you're editing, sometimes you have to cut the, the things that you love the most in the script you love, oh, this is the best scene ever, you know, but it goes back to if it harms the, the overall project, it's got to go. And the thing, you know, from I've done December, I just finished um, my 24th paid assignment, you know, working with producer and, you know, 
that makes it a lot easier to kill your darlings because when the edict comes down from above and says, this doesn't work, um, you know, you can uh, defend it, which I've done in the past, but you can't defend it too much because then you'll be look like this writer is very sensitive, you know, and difficult. Um, and then you'll learn once some things go into production, like my last film, by the way, it's going to premiere next Friday night, April 19th. I got to get in the plug, uh, smart home killer. Uh, it's a lifetime premiere at five and 9 PM, uh, April 19th, West coast, East coast, 8 PM midnight lifetime, uh, smart home killer. And I'll just use that as an example wrote these really amazing scenes, you know, for the thriller. Then director gets involved, production gets involved. What can be done? What can't be done? Um, this has to be cut. And I was like, oh, this is my, one of my favorite thing, but we have to switch it and do it this way because of this. And then so there becomes the practicalities of filmmaking and production. Um, ah, thank you, Nicoletta. Um, now, when you're writing your specs, of course, you've got this perfect world that you've created and everything's the way you want it which, it, which it should be. But just get used to the fact that your darlings will be sliced and diced uh, by production realities. And so if you become a um, production savvy screenwriter, those blows will not will not hurt as much, you know, when they say we need to cut 14 pages and you're like, aha, uh, but that's fine because you know, you crafted the whole thing and there's, there's room to cut. Right. But the 14 made it better because it was a more effective, right. Screenplay story. And also for production reasons and for budget. So there's all these factors that involve, but I would say you just have to get used to the fact that a scene that you love dearly may not work. And you're trying to force it, you know, and then it hurts the overall. So if it hurts the overall, it's got to go. You know, you have to be ruthless. Um, that's going to say about editing. But it does help when there are outside forces giving you those notes to edit, right? When you're by yourself writing your spec, you're almost defending yourself from yourself. Like, this is good. I'm not going to cut it. When there's a producer that says, we can't do this. Um, I know you love the scene, but practic practical reasons make it that it's got to go. And you're like, okay, 85% is there. I'm happy, you know, 90%, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, just from being, from doing this for such a long time, I think David Mamet says there's a an X tweet. They call them tweets anymore. I don't know about, you just got to be the person that doesn't go away. Now, at some point that can be insanity, right? You, you just say, Oh, nothing's happening. And I'm still going to continue this because right around that corner could be that opportunity that opens the door or it could not be in more another year clicks by. So each of us has to make that choice, right? Do you continue on this journey or do you say it was a good thing, but I'm done. You know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> Nicolette says the difficult things is how, which 15 pages are to be out. If you know, for example, that you need to cut 15 pages. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I had to cut 14, which is kind of shocking, but it was, it was a sequence, you know, in the thriller. And so we didn't need to be in that other part that those thrills or whatever didn't. So if we cut the sequence and just, as we say, cut to the chase, get them back to the house, uh, it helps everybody, right? Would I have liked those scenes? Yeah, there were a couple more scare moments and stuff, but um, I said, okay. But to your point, um, how do you know that's where you have trusted um, confidants, other writers who will read something and you can honestly ask them, look, 
do you think if I cut this, you know, and they say yes or no, because other writers, hopefully, um, Oh, deck to halls. Thank you so much. Uh, Jack 90. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my favorites as well. Deck to halls is a Christmas movie I wrote. Um, and, uh, it's on Tubi streaming, uh, for people to see. And it's also on YouTube, which is a, uh, proper licensed, you know, it's not a, you know, a stolen copy. Uh, which is good. But yeah, that's that's a near dear uh, film that I love. I've had two Christmas films made. Um, I wrote three. One didn't get made. Uh, or four, actually. No, excuse me. I wrote four Christmas movies. Two were made. Two weren't made. Which you'll find out happens, too. You know, I always thought that every, every movie I got paid to write would get made. And uh, every movie that I wrote would be purchased. You know, <laughs> it's not the case. Um, 24 assignments, 17 films are made. So, I mean, there's an attrition rate there and other movies end up on the shelf or they don't decide to go forward with them. And those are the harsh realities of the business, you know, um, back to the, uh, editing, uh, discussion. If you have those that you trust or a script consultant, which again, I'll throw in a plug. I'm, be I'm in between assignment jobs at the moment. So, my shingle is open. I do uh, script consulting as well. You can check out my website, fiveoclockblue.net, uh, for all those services. Um, I do, I do in-depth consultation. You know, you'll get probably, depending on the quality of the project, probably 10 to 20 pages of specific notes, you know, um, the notes like I get from producers, you know, and they're not trying to change my notes never try to change like, oh, I would, you know, I try to look at what you were trying to do and how you can be eff more effective. I see what you're trying to do. And if you just did this, it would raise that up kind of thing. Um, but critical analysis if things work or not. So it always helps back to the editing question um, to not just write in a vacuum, to have others that you trust. I'm blessed to have a, a circle of writer friends who will not let me off the hook Um because writers, I think we always try to get something by, like, I'll write this. It's my darling. And then they'll go, ah, that didn't work. Well, and then you try to defend it. And then you go, yeah, it didn't work. <clears throat> and then when you start working, um, you try to defend your material, uh, but not too much. Because, uh, you know, a difficult writer is something that no producer wants to work with. Um, a quick story, I was uh, finished a script. And the producer was busy making other films. So he unleashed me upon the executive producers and there was a Zoom meeting and I'd never met them before. And they were going point by point through the script. And I was the last line of defense, right? Because the producer wasn't there with me. And I know the script intimately because I wrote it. So they start saying, well, you know, the ending and the God and say, yeah, we think you should cut this part. And I was like, ah, I said, you know, uh, with all due respect, and I went in with specific evidence of why that would be tragic to cut that because we set up and spent a lot of time with X, Y, Z and the arc of the thing. And, blah, blah, blah. and after I defended it, there was silence. And then the exec producer was like, okay, I'll buy that. Okay. Moving on. I won that battle, you know, oh my gosh, but you don't want to do that with every note because then they'll be like, we want to make this film. You know, are you trying not to, to help us make this film? No, I'm trying to help you make this film. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, I think, I think there's a respect there too, that you just don't roll over as the writer that you do offer, um, that you do offer something of, of substance with evidence to back it up. Because I mean, who else are you going to talk to about the movie, but the writer, you know? So if you just say, yes, book, yes, book. Okay. What do I need to do? And then you really find something. It's like, mm, that doesn't sound too good. That's going to be disastrous. So you got to bring it up, but you can't do it throughout the whole meeting. So I, you know, you pick and choose your battles. Uh, Jay LaChase. The notes you gave were very helpful. Uh, made me go all the way back to my outline for a rewrite. John. Hey, John. That's great, man. I um, 
I, I try, I, uh, you know, we just never know. Um, I did a script with a partner, <clears throat> writing partner over um, COVID and we uh, got it to five or six of our friends who are writers and everyone came back with, they all liked it, but they came back with different comments and we could clearly, we knew the direction we wanted to go. And some of them were like, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. That's interesting, but thank you. Uh, but overall, we did feel that we had to scale it down uh, the budget a bit. It was a sci-fi movie. So that was the overall um, note that we took from, you know, those six that we had read it. Um, Nicoletta, you're welcome for the answer. Hope, hopefully. Uh... So as I said, uh, I say, I've been watching your content for years, your interviews you've done so far. Ah, thank you, John. Um, you know, you have to be humble. I'm humble anyway. I don't want to, you know, besides the business, but this business will humble you in five seconds, you know, to think that we're all greater than the craft and, you know, well, we're going to sell my spec for a million dollars. And then you get out there and, you know, things take time and time marches on and time continues to march on. And boy, is it a long time. And like I said, seven years for my spec. Uh, the movie All Remember April, it was seven years and it almost won the Nickel Fellowship. It was in the top 20 screenplays um, and they picked eight to get, you know, that year to get the fellowship. And so they called me on the phone and said, wow, you came pretty close out of 3,500 scripts. Um, they said, I hope, uh, would you like some notes? I said, yeah, to tell me. And they said, well, I hope you don't enter it next year. I hope you're, it gets picked up or optioned. And sure enough, within the next year, it, it was optioned um, and then purchased. So, um, you know, it's not every project. I've had projects that I wrote and within six months they were filmed. They were filming. Um, last year, when was it? It was January and they were filming by uh, July. Off from a pitch that I, that I sold, you know. So, <clears throat> you know, some things are quick and other things are a long time. And... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in a business where nothing happens as fast as you would like it. Um, you have to really be patient uh, because nothing happens on your time or my time. It's Hollywood's time. <clears throat> and that is a weird time warp because, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's something you have to get used to. Um, and so I would also say help others if you can uh, in life in general, but in the business, people remember when you help them. Um, I've done it so many times where there's a job opportunity that comes in and it maybe it's not right for me. Or I think that's not in my wheelhouse. I'll contact another writer and who, I, who I trust, you know, because my reputation, if I send them somewhere that uh, they're a solid writer um, I did this for a consulting client once that um, she's a fantastic writer. I mean, just amazing. And an opportunity came in and it, she was very right for it. I was not. And I said, I know someone who would be perfect for this. Boom. You know, and people remember that and you remember that. Um, and a lot of times the business is not that way. You know, when you get to the levels of companies and producers and people like that, um, where you can get ghosted, where you're like, we work together. What's happening? Yeah, it, you know. Um, <clears throat> so you like to work with those people who have integrity and um, authenticity and honesty, which is something that even though they might, people that you get exposed to, you still, I believe, should have that inside always. Because you don't want to change who you are because of them. You know, you always want to be, boom, integrity. You know, that's important. It's the script is due. You know, my last assignment, it was due. Uh, and I turned it in the day of, the morning of, it was due. Because that's what you do. <laughs> you know, uh, if it's late, all right, maybe a day late, but that's not what I agreed to. That's not we. That's not what we had in the contract. 
Um, so, you know, honor, be a person of your word uh, and, and build your integrity that way with, with everything you do in the business, you know, uh, meetings, show up early, you know, don't be late. And uh, so any other questions? Um, again, uh, not to hawk the book again, but a screenwriter's journey to success is on Amazon. Um, like I say, it's five years to write the book and 20 years to live it. Uh, and it's not how to write a screenplay, but it's how to live the life of a writer, which is difficult as it is. Um, everything from how to take a meeting, um, how to have a daily discipline, which is difficult for the best of us. I mean, for all of us, <laughs> it gets the best of us, excuse me. Um, you know, procrastination comes everywhere. You know, like I always said, never had a more clean uh, house than when something's not working. Um, when you're writing, it gets the best of you because um, it's hard. And when you, you hit that that wall, ugh, you know, and you, you deviate, turn on the TV, go to do this, you know, and then suddenly a day or two goes by and you lose that momentum, you know, that great momentum. Um, like I said, I used to run um, five miles a day. So it, it's that, it was that momentum that I loved about running. And it's the same thing with your page count every day, you know, boom, boom. You know, my last assignment, I had to do traditionally about five pages a day, uh, which is a, is a pretty good clip, you know, to, to write. Some days were three, some days I got two. And then another day I got seven. So it all sort of evens out, hopefully, but you're writing every day and you're coming back to it in that world. So it's not two or three days. And then you have to re-envision like, huh, and what were my characters doing? And where were you? We, you know, you start to stumble along the way. So I think it's really important to have that daily discipline because all the other stuff can get the best of you. <clears throat> excuse me, and life can get in the way too. Now, when I'm on assignment, I'm getting paid. So that's my job. I can't have things interrupted, but I do have the luxury of shifting my, my day. So sometimes, and on this last one too, I found out the mornings were not working well. And then I wouldn't start writing until midday into afternoon, into evening. So I've been on, on assignments before where it worked like that, where I, where I said, I'm going to get up in the morning and hit the ground running and Bah, bah, bah. And then something was like, whoa, whoa, you know, and I wouldn't. So I thought, well, maybe. And then it was resistance. So I thought, well, maybe on this one, it's OK that I start at one o'clock in the afternoon or two and write till eight, you know, as long as the page count is done for the day because I can shift it. And then just being OK with that and settling in and saying, OK, and then you hit around page 45, 50 and you're like, wow, uh, think I have a movie here, you know? <laughs> um, so anybody throw out any other questions or things that you're going through that um, you may have a question about? Um, and uh, in comedy, how can you show character wound fears without ruining the fun of the comedy? Well, you know, in comedy, there's always a tinge of seriousness, right? Underneath, you know, the, 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 that's why some of the great comedic actors, I mean, the great comedians are great dramatic actors. Uh, we've seen it with Adam Sandler, Jerry Lewis. I mean, you, they do a dramatic role and you're like, wow, you know, um, it's a delicate balance, but you can still show it in a comedic way with the tone, I think, um, their wound, their fears. If they have a fear uh, about something, it can be done in a funny way, but it's serious because if it continues on, then, you know, it's going to be a problem. Um, you know, the, um, trying to think of an example of uh, the, uh, well, Look at Billy Wilder's films, you know, those are classic comedies, but there's a tinge of seriousness underneath it. That's a great tone that he set 
um, like in, in the apartment. I mean, it deals with attempted suicide and, and infidelity and all these things that you'd figure, but it's a comedy. Um, but he has these moments of, of levity, you know, with the seriousness um, underneath. So it's a very delicate balance, but I would say, um, you know, watch other films to see how, how that's done. Um, you know, without ruining the fun, because it's not all fun and games. Every comedy is just not, you know, uh, if you look closer, there's a tragic clown there, you know, in the, in the comedy, I would think. Um, but, uh, anyone, um, entering contests with your scripts or, uh, finishing up scripts or, um, having any sort of, uh, good news, shall we say, we always have to celebrate the little successes along the way because, you know, they add up to big successes and that's what keeps us going from, uh, from, uh, you know, project to project. Um, right now I'm pitching, I've got, uh, about 10 pitches and a, uh, a spec in the marketplace. Um, waiting to hear, waiting to hear. That's what we do. We wait to hear, but we don't wait. We continue to create projects. Um, and many times, you know, people ask, do I need to live in Los Angeles um, to be a screenwriter? No, you don't. But we have a unique opportunity here to be around the business, you know, very easily. Somebody, let's have a coffee. And yeah, you can do a Zoom, but, you know, you can go here or you're just out and about, um, old story that I put in, in, that I put in the book. Um, I was out with a friend at a restaurant. We were waiting at the bar for our table and he's chats up someone. He's talking to this woman and blah, blah, blah. And in the, she says, Oh, she's an assistant to one of the biggest producers in town. He says, my friend's a screenwriter. Oh, really? Oh, what have you done? Blah, blah, blah. So we start chatting it up and, um, you know, it didn't end up being something, but it could have if the assistant said, well, what are you working on? And then I happened to do, you know, the elevator pitch. And then she said, wow, you know what? I really like that. Could you send that over to me? It would be that easy. Right. So those kind of things happen out here, you know, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. Another one recently, a friend of mine um, had a film shoot at his house. And he says, uh, I'm not going to be here. So he asked me, could you come over and sort of be the house liaison? I said, yeah. Um, and so I went and I knew the director. I didn't, I knew him professionally. I never met him, but he knew of me and he knew of my reputation and what I had done. And funny enough, we had worked together indirectly because a producer that I worked for had me consult on a script that this director had written. And so he remembered that I gave such great notes. So we're chatting it up and blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was amazing. So I just have pitched him a bunch of uh, ideas now. So, you know, you never know when you're out and about in, in, you know, or, or someone says, Hey, can you work on my project? Let's say at a, at a college level, you know, or your or or not even if somebody's doing independent film, they say, "Could you work on my film?" You go, "Yeah, I'll go and support it." Um, you know, there's just so much that you get from from screenings to to so many things uh, about being here than being somewhere else. I'm not saying move here because it's tremendously expensive and you know, all the other stuff, but um, it does help to be around it. You know, that's instead of just being once in a while by an email and on Zoom. Um, you're not going to make those face-to-face -face relationships where you can go to the party or go to the event or go to the screening, you know. John has, after years of writing scripts as a hobby, trying to adapt one into a book, it's difficult as the, as if they're turned into films, the director, DP, elevate the material. But now I must... Uh, Lopi recently started adapting some of my old spec scripts into novels. Ah, it was challenging at first, but I find it lets me explore the aspects of the plot and characters uh, that it couldn't be on the screen. Yes, I have heard and seen and know that many writers are adapting their scripts into novels because 
I mean, you know, you can flesh it out and, and you have room to breathe, right? You can make it 150 pages, 200 pages. Um, in fact, a client of mine just did that and it's great. The book is like, wow, I started reading it. It's, it's fantastic. It's, you know, it, it reminds me of having read the, the, uh, the TV pilot, excuse me. So that's being done. And then, you know, the publishing game is, is a whole nother thing to get a book published and deal with all that. And, uh, you know, but if you come in with an IP and let's say your book makes some noise and sells and gets a little popular, then, you know, it could be reverse engineering and engineered and have them say, Oh, we'd love you to adapt this into a screenplay. And you go, really? And then you go, I just happen to have the screenplay. But either way, um, I've never adapted a book into a script. It's very, um, I, it would be very uh, interesting. <laughs> Not that I couldn't do it, but I've never, I've never been asked uh, as a job to take a book because it's all about, you know, truncating and, and what, what you extract. Cause a lot of times people see a movie that was a book and they go, eh, the book was better. Right. Because they had more time to develop things and we don't in a movie. So, um, but yeah, I've, I've come across a handful of writers who are adapting their scripts into books and it just feels more that you can then publish, right? You can self publish, you can promote, you know, you can't do that with a script because you need the movie to be shot from the script. So you don't want to be sending your script out, publishing it, you know, <clears throat> I think you want to keep it close to your vest, you know. Um, so any other questions? Um, trying to think about different subjects. Um, you know, if you're going to survive in this over the long haul, you have to have a game plan and just, you know, throwing darts at a board with a blindfold is not a game plan. So you have to build, you know, there's the one thing about writing in your cave and, and creating solid material and, and being a writer that can compete with whatever projects that you write. I would say write those that you're passionate about. If you don't like horror films, don't be writing them because it's going to show unless you're paid to write them, then it's your heart's desire. But, you know, I think your passion will come across in the project of, of something that you really, um, you really take. Uh, my take on AI um, you know, that was the, was the strike was about, thank goodness. They said, you can't copyright AI, you know, created material. I just used it recently because I was having some story, like what should happen next? You know, I got, I sort of wrote myself into a corner of the ending. I know how it ends, but you know, the action beats in between. And so I went to chat, uh, GPT Ba -ba -bum, and I sort of laid out the scenario and, and damned if it didn't um, give me options that were kind of obvious, a few of them, but some of them, a few were not. And I, it just made me then think, and it's the same thing I kind of did with my friend who's a writer just two days ago, I pitched him the whole thing and I walked him through it. And then I said, but I'm at the end. So I got all this stuff set up and I'm sort of stuck at what, how A, B and C happens, but I know the very final scene. So he said, yeah, let me have to think about that. So using it not to create your outline, but using it where you ask questions like I'm stuck. Um, but you have to give them the information, obviously. I'm stuck. Uh, what would these characters <clears throat> you know, do? And there's this element in, in the house. How could that be used to get them this? And then it goes, whoop, you know, it comes up. So, uh, but the idea that it's editing movies now and can direct a movie and create, I mean, it's just, um, it's kind of scary that it's, you know, it's being accepted. It's like, well, you will be, um, useless <laughs> creator. So yeah, the AI thing is, um, you know, kind of scary. I mean, that, that it was saying, uh, it's almost, as smart as Einstein, but in the next few years, it'd be a hundred times as smart, which would be smarter than we are even possible. 
So you start to get into like crazy science fiction stuff, you know. Greg, hey. Oh, yes. The, yes, the Magic Apples. And, oh, Nickel Fellowship. That's fantastic, Greg. Uh, would placing in the nickel make a difference? Greg uh, wrote a fantastic script that I consulted on. <clears throat> and um, he's just saying that he entered in the Nickel Fellowship. Um, and that uh, would it matter if, if he placed? Well, Example of my script, I'll remember April, my original script, um, it placed. It was a top 20 nickel place. It didn't win the eight fellowships, but that was enough for me to get an agent interested in a big agency as a hip pocket client. And then that sort of accolade was like, yeah, it came, it was a top 20 nickel. And people go, oh, they take notice because nickel is one of the top screenwriting contests. So um, how much would it matter? I don't know. Um, it may get you a read after that, who knows. But for your project, I would say target um, target the, the, uh, the folks that kind of make that, that genre of, of a movie. Um, but uh, yeah. And Nicoletta says, may I ask one last question? I'm so sorry. Advice how to figure out the specific target target audience of a script. <clears throat> well, hopefully you've done that before you wrote it <clears throat> and not after because it kind of does matter. Um, and then people say, well, this is, everyone wants to see this movie. Well, some movies are geared for, you know, there's a streamer that um, hopefully I'll be pitching to and now they only want Gen Z. You know, that's all we're focused on, you know. Um, if it's a drama, obviously it's going to skew maybe older. Um, you know, it depends on what your story is about. If it's a, a comedy, what are the ages of the of the leads? That's going to sort of determine it as well. Um, you know, are they in their thirties? Are they in their twenties? Um, are they teens? It's a teen comedy, so these are all, you know, aspects of, um, you know, but. It will matter uh, when you start um, trying to go out with it because they'll they'll say, "Well, who's your audience?" You know, and it, it helps to um, <clears throat> to know that. Um, so I see we're heading up at the one hour mark. Um, any other questions for anybody? I hope this has been informative. I, I'd like to do more of these um, if people would like it. Um, I uh, love interacting with writers. And, um, and as I say, if you'd like some help navigating the trenches, uh, do check out my book, um, screenwriters journey to success. Uh, it's available now on Amazon, um, as a paperback, which I think is the best way, but it is a, there's also a Kindle print replica, which is basically a PDF. Um, that's also another way. And, uh, as I do also mention, I have consulting services at five o'clock blue.net, which is my website. You can go check that out with all the other good stuff. And of course, you're already on my YouTube channel. And I try to do videos when I can and post them about the uh, about the journey. It's a long haul journey. But uh, as I always say, you have to love it. And uh, more than anything else, because um, it is a grind. And it keeps getting harder. And when you when you have that one project that sells, that doesn't make a career. You have to do it again and again and then again and again and again. And hopefully between those agains, it's not a long span of time of, of years and years, but one never knows. Like I said, not every project that you write uh, you know, on assignment uh, will be made. <clears throat> And others will, and some won't be made at all. Um, but you just have to, uh, again, like I said, enjoy the little successes uh, along the way. Um, anybody have any final questions or comments before I wrap this up? Uh, I do appreciate you taking your morning uh, wherever you are. And uh, thank you, John. Um, 
I will, uh, yeah, I'll be doing more of these. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, Greg. Uh, many thanks, all the best, you too. And, and like I said, keep the faith and keep writing because uh, as I always say, if you stop writing, there's one guarantee in a business of no guarantees, there's one guarantee that you'll never have any chance at success. Um, so just be smart about the way you, you go at it because the writing the script is one thing. And then there's this whole other aspect of the business and they're interconnected, but it's hard enough to sit down and, and finish something that you love and care about, um, and want to share with others and hopefully get them to read it. That's also <laughs> seems like a very difficult thing. Um, anyway, take care and, uh, I'll set up another one of these, uh, soon and, um, keep filling those blank pages. Okay. And you can find me on X at ScriptCat. Uh, you can go to my blog, uh, my blank page that's on WordPress and, um, you're on my YouTube channel and all of those things can be found at my website, five o'clock blue.net. And, uh, that's also where my Screenplay Consulting Services are listed. And then one final plug, next Friday night, the premiere of my latest uh, thriller, Smart Home Killer. It was an original pitch that I sold last year. And it's going to be a Lifetime Network, uh, April 19th at 5 and 8 p.m. Pacific time and 8 p.m. and midnight East Coast time. And then after that, it goes uh, internationally and Canada. So that'll be good to... Uh, have a global audience, right? That's what we want is people to see our stuff. Um, okay. Take care. We'll talk soon.